though. So if you guys heard that, we are recording now. So welcome again. Um, just some general housekeeping. If you guys could all um, mute your microphones when you're not talking, that it helps uh, reduce some feedback um, while our presenters are presenting. Um, also, if you did not have the chance to type your name, uh, your organiz organization and your county into the chat, please do that. Uh, that helps us kind of keep track for attendance. Um, and definitely feel free to use the chat um, if you have any questions. Um, that will be a little easier than interrupting our presenters as uh, the presentations are going on. So uh, we'll be monitoring that. And as we uh, get to the end of the presentations, then if we haven't answered your question or stopped, uh, we will uh, ask you or we will interrupt to do that. So um, did I miss anything, guys? No, I That's think you got it. it. Only other thing is uh, if we do call on you to um, further explain your question, if you would go ahead and announce who you are speaking, because with this many attendees, it's uh, sometimes it's hard to see who it is asking that question. So when you unmute, if you just please announce who you are and, and we'll go from there. All right, thanks. Lori, did you get to talk about your county's updates while I was uh, trying to log back in? You okay, great. It. <laughs> All right, cool. Then it looks like we're right on time. Um, we're going to go ahead and start talking about, uh, well, first, I'd like to thank the South Mountain Partnership and the Foundation for Enhancing Communities for partnering with us tonight to be here this evening and also for running our registrations. Uh, Katie Hess is joining us tonight. She's the director of the South Mountain Partnership and director of Pennsylvania Landscape Conservation for the Appalachian Trail Conservancy. The South Mountain Partnership is a regional landscape scale conservation project in South Central Pennsylvania. It was launched in 2006 and it operates as a public and private partnership between DCNR and the Appalachian Trail Conservancy. And it's grown into an alliance of citizens, businesses, nonprofits, academic institutions, and local state and federal government agencies and officials collaborating to envision and secure a sustainable future for the South Mountain landscape. So Katie, if you're ready to take it from here, I believe we can get you screen sharing if you'd like to. Um, and again, if anyone has any questions for Katie, go ahead and throw them in the chat box. And uh, Katie, thanks for being with us. Thank you. Okay. You should see a PowerPoint slide. We got it. And someone told me earlier that PowerPoint is like one of the most up-to-date forms of torture. So I hope that's not the case tonight. <laughs> So again, my name is Katie Hess. I direct the South Mountain Partnership and early in 2021, I began serving as the Landscape Conservation Director for the Appalachian Trail Conservancy um, in Pennsylvania, which means that I work up and down the trail corridor with a portion of my time with the other conservation landscapes adjacent to the trail and the trail corridor and um, that's a whole other story, but basically the, the Appalachian Trail Conservancy is um, getting back to its roots and um, thinking of itself as more of a mega greenway rather than just a footpath. So that very much aligns with our landscape conservation work as the South Mountain Partnership. Okay. So uh, for those who don't know me, I'm a native of this area. I first grew up in Franklin County, and then I grew up on the other side of South Mountain in uh, Adams County, just north of Gettysburg. And this is me in a nutshell. I develop solutions for this region that are that meet the triple bottom line of what it means to be sustainable. Everything needs to be economically, culturally, and environmentally sustainable. And so I try to bring that to everything that we do um, as an organization and a network. And I wanted to just breeze through this for folks who aren't familiar with us and our initiative, why this region is deemed unique because as a native growing up here, I was never taught about um, the uniqueness of this place either. And I think it's a great story. And so this is how it was explained to me. And I think it's wonderful. 
we are um, the northern terminus of the Blue Ridge Mountains. And this is why we are uh, uh, called out as one of the conservation landscape regions of Pennsylvania. And that red circle is our region. It's the convergence of the Blue Ridge Mountains, the Ridge and Valley region, and the Piedmont region. And so as many of you know, that has watershed impl implications, um, geology, hydrogeology implications, but it also has lots of, you know, geographic, um, historical land use implications as well. I think someone got unmuted again. So the way we approach our sustainability work is through hosting partnership meetings. These are regional meetings. If you haven't been one, to one, please get to one when we start holding them in person again after the pandemic. It's a great way to network with like-minded individuals and get more resources for you and your organization, even to recruit new volunteers and future leaders. We also have a mini grant program, which I would encourage each and every one of you to, um, to consider applying for this spring, you and your organizations, local municipalities, counties, um, and other nonprofits are eligible to compete for funding. And um, we have all of that information on our website that opens in uh, the first week of April. And we also uh, host uh, speaker series lectures. These have mostly been around water quality issues for the last few years as that has been our, our main focus. So this is our, this is a, a few pictures to keep you engaged. This is what our Power of the Partnership uh, event looks like. We draw over 130 individuals usually. And it's a lot of fun, lots of awards are given and mini grant checks are handed out. This is more of our, our spring and our fall meeting. It's more um, casual, more focused on learning and you know just connecting individuals from throughout the landscape. Um, and again, we've been highlighting that water work throughout the region as our counties have been struggling with the, the water implementation plans and now the clean water uh, partners and partnerships that they're launching along with your organizations. Uh, we've been trying to, to bring that to everyone who cares about conservation in one way or another throughout the region. Um, if you're interested in the mini grant program and specifically in, in water projects that we've funded in the past, we have this story map on our website now. Um, a lot of people still don't know about this. That's why I've included it in my update. Um, and it's a great resource that both maps our previous mini grant awards and then provides a little um, summary of it and links to any products that were created. So this is an example, uh, one of the bridges in uh, Pine Grove Furnace State Park was built through a mini grant, some master planning in downtown Gettysburg, which included green infrastructure was funded. Um, this highlights our speaker series, Richard Lewis. I think you'll find yourself in one of these photos. This was the speaker series uh, from South Mountain to your glass. And just a plug for, for everyone, we're always looking for partners to partner with us on the creation of a speaker series. So if you want your project highlighted, um, you wanna talk about a specific issue around water, get in touch with us. Our program committee would love to work with you um, to create a speaker series. And this is another good one, also centered around water. This was, um, this was done in partnership with Central Pennsylvania Conservancy before they acquired the Latorte Spring Garden property, which now is a preserve that protects the headwaters of the Latorte Spring Run. So this was my last slide. I was trying to keep it under 10 minutes, um, just highlighting a little bit of the water quality work that we've been able to assist with. Um, you know, you guys are much more on the ground doing the really detailed um, 
you know, sort of like dirty work. You're, you're out there in the fields making it happen. And so we were trying to bring in um, some resources just to plug any gaps that we saw. And so if I can use the pointer here, the laser pointer, hopefully you guys can see this. We started out um, with the Chesapeake Bay Funders Network back in 2017, which um, got us even, you know, focused on a landscape scale on water quality and how to best serve our local community uh, around that. We didn't want to replace anyone. We wanted to try to figure out how to support who was already there. Um, that led us to sort of where we are now and a, a bit of an update. We had started on a path to create a customized mapping application for our counties as they seek to implement their countywide action plans, which is you know, uh, linked to the Chesapeake Bay blueprint and Pennsylvania meeting its water quality uh, goals as that interstate uh, agreement for improving the, the Chesapeake Bay water health. Um, and so we started down that path and we had an opportunity to leverage more money through a partnership with the American Farmland Trust. And so we went on that route and we were able to bring restoration reports to each county in the region. I think one or two counties already had it, but now every county will have it. And it sounds like this is a really important um, tool that had been missing before. So we're really happy that, that that's coming through and down the pipeline. And you, show, you all actually should have received a survey link from us, um, either from Caitlin Lewis, Elizabeth Grant, or myself, if you're in Franklin or Cumberland County asking if you want your organization to be included in restoration reports, because that's where, you know, people who are interested in using their property for better protection of water quality are going to go, and you can be listed as a potential resource and get leads for your work there. So if you, um, if you need to follow up about that, please feel free to reach out to me. Um, and then I've just highlighted, I didn't get to the, um, I highlighted some of the workshops that we've hosted in partnership with many of our partners. Um, but I think we started that work in 2018, but I didn't have a chance to list those here. So um, how many more minutes do I have? I'm sorry. We're there if you want to just okay. finish up for us. Thanks. Yes, Debbie. I will. Thank you. Um, Moving forward, if the South Mountain Partnership is successful in our latest grant application to DCNR, we will be moving adjacent to water resources and working on a regional, a state of the environment report card for the entire region and water quality is gonna be a really big part of that. So we'll still be involved we won't be absolutely focused, but um, stick with us and please stay close. Awesome. Thank you so much, Katie. Thanks for that great information and all the hard work you're doing to connect us all. Um, and thanks for also uh, putting a shout out to our CAP coordinators who are going to be with us later in the program tonight to share a little bit more about what they're doing. Thank you. I, I think I saw uh kelly come in here and yep, i'm here joe awesome thanks for being here kelly of course. so i i was just gonna go ahead and um it, we're, will you be screen sharing tonight or are you just gonna be yes. speaking with us okay awesome so if you and laurie can get that set up i'll go ahead and let everyone know that kelly sitch joins us this evening to share the benefits of using native plants and converting lawns to meadows kelly is a forest ecologist for the pennsylvania department of conservation and natural resources whose work focuses on rare plant species protection and forest habitat monitoring for the Pennsylvania Bureau of Forestry. He also works to promote the use of mixed and native grasses and wildflowers on and off state forest lands. 
Kelly will be discussing the positive impact that native plants can have on wild and suburban landscapes and how to convert non-native grass lawns to native meadows. So Kelly, if you get yourself set up, then you can take it away. And I appreciate you being with us tonight. Uh, and again, if anyone has any questions and you want to get them in the chat, we'll convey them on to Kelly at a slide change. All right. Can, uh, can you see my presentation, Joe? Yes. Yep. You're up and good to go. Thanks. All right. Fantastic. Uh, well, thanks for having me, everyone. Uh, I'm excited to chat with you all a little bit about native plants and about uh, turf to meadow. And I, I suspect that, uh, at least for the first portion of this talk, I'm going to be preaching to the converted a little bit when it comes to the benefits of native plants. But I do think it's important. Uh, maybe when you all are talking with some other folks that you work with, you'll find some good talking points or some maybe different ways of thinking about it that might be helpful in some of your conversations uh, with other folks and spreading the good word about native plants. Uh, and hopefully, too, the, the idea of turf to meadow is something you've heard a little bit about maybe and uh, it can give you a little bit more information about how to go about that. Uh, and then Kelsey, one of my colleagues, is going to follow up and talk about our DCNR program we have. So I, I think it's important to start with, uh, you know, answering the question you may have is why is somebody from the Bureau of Forestry talking about native plants? And believe it or not, uh, in the Bureau of Forestry mission, in addition to protecting our Commonwealth's forests, we're also charged with conserving native wild plants. So we are the jurisdictional agency for plants in Pennsylvania, and thankfully for myself, Kelsey, and a lot of other folks, we get to do a lot of cool work, not just uh, in the forest, but also in and around your communities. And I think the first thing we need to do is make sure we're all working off the same definition. What do we mean by native plants? And I am a company man, so our official definition is a species that other than as a result of an introduction, either historically occurred in Pennsylvania or currently occurs here. And uh, there's 3,100 plant species found in our state that we know of. And of that, about 2,300 are native. And just to give you an idea of the breakdown, uh, of those 3,100, there's about 1,900 native flowering plants, another 25 conifers and 100 species of ferns. I have the approximate tildes there because you know, botanists like to argue about the locales of certain species and when they came into Pennsylvania, or you know, who brought them, who took them, who first observed them. So all these numbers are a little bit shaky, uh, but they're pretty close. And believe it or not, there's about 500 plant species of concern in this state. And of those, there's 200 endangered, 78 threatened, and 39 rare plants. So those are plants protected by law in the Commonwealth. We also have another 150 plants that are technically undetermined. They're species that there is concern that they're in decline, uh, but more research is being done and more field work to determine them all. We also have three PA vulnerable plants. These are plants vulnerable to collection. That's ginseng, golden seal, and yellow lady seals. And believe it or not, we have two federally endangered species that grow in Pennsylvania. Uh, they're there pictured in the slide, the Northeastern Bulrush and the World Pagonia. So why do we want to conserve and promote native plants? Well, I suspect that we all could rattle off a number of the reasons in this wheel, but I think it's important to, to note the breadth of impact that plants have on humans, even before we talk about other ecosystems. You know, they're providing us food and raw materials. They're regulating our climate, our air, our water, and strengthening our soils. Uh, they also provide a ton of cultural values in terms of medical, mental and physical health and give us opportunities for recreation. And they're everywhere around us and they're providing the backbone of every ecosystem, however large, small, rare, or common. But I think the, the kind of crux of our conversation tonight has to do with pollinators and the fact that native plants support our native pollinators far better than anything in the landscaping trade. And I'm sure that uh, you all have read books and articles and heard things on the news about the decline of native pollinators, uh, butterflies, moths, insects, bees, and also the decline of honeybees uh, in our state and across the country. And the, the problem with this is that most of the non-native plants that were sold in, in landscaping stores and that we're planting or have been planting for a long time are, are marketed because they're pest resistant and they grow quickly. And you know, that works and that's great marketing and it's not untrue. But when you consider the flip side, if something's pest resistant, that means that no insects can eat it. 
uh, which might be good, but is bad for our native insects if there's less and less food sources out there. And they grow quickly because they can outcompete other plants. Uh, they likely don't have any disease issues or pest issues. Um, all things that make a plant great to sell to homeowners, but not so great to be part of the ecosystem. So a lot of our native insects have co-evolved with our native plants. And a lot of them are very, very specialized, picky about not just what they eat, but when they eat and where they reproduce and lay their eggs. But if we don't really care about the pollinators, we can work our way up the food chain. Uh, this is a slide that I borrowed from Doug Tallamy, just to give an idea of all the different types of bird species that at some uh, one of their life stages or multiple life stages rely on insects for food. Quite a list. But maybe songbirds isn't your thing either. We can keep working our way up the food web and talk about mammals. We can talk about reptiles and amphibians. We can talk about spiders. All these species rely at some point in their lives on insects as a food source. And unfortunately, there's been a lot of stories more recently in the news discussing global wildlife populations in decline or North American songbirds uh, in decline. And these are all symptomatic of many environmental issues that we have in our country and our world. But uh, one of the big ones is a lack of reliable food sources, particularly the lack of insects and plants. And you know, beyond just being a source for pollinators, we can also think of plants in more of a landscape or ecosystem context when it comes to wildlife. You know, plants don't just provide the forage that wildlife need, but they also provide the habitat that these species need, places where they can hunt successfully for food. And a lot of our native plants provide better nutrition. You know, I often talk to folks who mention that there's a number of non-native plants that they've planted, uh, invasive species like barberry or autumn olive that wildlife like to eat. Uh, and that is true, but I liken it to candy or to pizza. You know, something that almost all of us enjoy eating, but it doesn't really provide the same nutrition as other foods. So certainly, uh, songbirds in particular will eat the berries of some of these invasive plants, but it's not providing the kind of nutrition they need. And as we increase the amount of native plant species in our landscapes, we can attract more native insects, which benefit the wildlife. Now, the other thing to think about is habitat structure. Uh, a lot of our wildlife prefer a more open sort of uh, ground level, so to speak, underneath some of our plants. It provides better movement, especially for small birds. These turkey poults like it quite a bit. It covers them from being predated from above. You know, when we, even if we grow our lawn grasses out, they're turf forming, they're sod forming, and they don't really provide the same structure, uh, let alone the right food. And one of the cool things about native grasses in particular is that they provide thermal cover even in the winter. And when we're talking about game species in particular, you know, providing winter forage and cover in the same location is always going to provide a better habitat uh, for wildlife. I really like this slide because as we transition away from critters and more towards environmental health, uh, I would draw your attention to the left side of the screen. And you can see it's very tiny. Uh, that's their turf grass. And the axis there is ground level. So we can see how tall these plants are and the opposite is true, we can see how deeply rooted they are. And it's very clear in just a quick inspection of this chart that all of our native grasses and wildflowers are decreasing and have tremendous root systems and are doing way more to increase infiltration, improve soil health, hold soil in place than our lawn grasses. I mean, they look puny by comparison. Look all the more uh, rooting depth you have there versus these gigantic root structures. And that's how a lot of these native species are able to survive uh, in the heat of the summer and droughty conditions in the pauper soils, because uh, they can really stretch down into the soil. The other thing that I think is really cool about native grasses is that they actually create new topsoil at a faster rate than lawn grasses or leaves. And you can see my partner Andrew there holding a bunch of last year's grass that's kind of down in that space in between the grasses that we talked about with the turkey poles is hitting that soil directly and it's gonna to create topsoil at a much faster rate. But there's a lot of threats to native plants. And first and foremost is our friend, the white-tailed deer. I don't know about you all, but I have a tremendous problem here in the suburbs of Harrisburg with deer eating all of my plants. 
but it is a major threat to native species across the strait while deep densities are high. Of course, destruction of habitat is a threat to native plants, uh, whether it's a fallow field or a forest, there's native plant communities there. And when they're bulldozed under, unfortunately, they're not gonna come back the next year. Uh, one of the things that frustrates me a lot is the indiscriminate spraying of roadsides and corridors with herbicide. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more about herbicide when we talk about meadow creation, but you know, herbicide is a valuable tool, but when it's sprayed kind of willy-nilly or indiscriminately, uh, even at the correct rate, you know, this, this herbicide is going to kill all those plants, beneficial ones, lawn grasses, invasives, native plants, they're all getting sprayed. There's no intention towards the control you're trying to provide. And really all you end up with is a lot of dead vegetation or burn back leaves. And as many of you probably know, our invasive plants tend to be pretty tolerant and can re-sprout, uh, whereas our native plants struggle a little bit more to come back from this kind of herbicide damage. Uh, this threat to plants is a little bit more social in nature, but I think it's important to mention, it's the idea of plant blindness. You know, we all uh, probably think more about plants than the average citizen of the Commonwealth, but the idea here is that plants form the background. It's just green behind everything that we're paying attention to. Uh, every tree is the same, every grass is the same, every flower is the same, and whatever happens around those plants with wildlife, with people, is all we care about. And I think that there's a lot to be said for this. You know, think about any time you watch a nature documentary, almost always the wildlife is the star of the show. And it's maybe with good cause, we can relate, we can personify them. Uh, they are more active, obviously, and maybe more interesting to the layperson. But and what we really need is to talk about the ecosystem and talk about how valuable and necessary plants are for any other living thing, including ourselves. Hey, Kelly. Yes. Um, this is Tammy Piper. Um, I just wanted to see if you'd be willing to take a couple of questions that have come into the chat box. Is that okay to do that now or would you rather save them towards the end? Um, I guess we could take a couple. Okay, um, so the first one that came in says, Kelly, do you have a go-to native plant list as we head tor towards prime garden slash landscaping season? Well, there's a lot of great plant lists out there. Uh, as I mentioned, I've got to promote the DCNR stuff first. So we do have lists on the DCNR website. If you search for PADCNR and native plants, you can find a lot of those resources. I think that there's a lot of great sources out there. Some of our other collaborators, the Xerxes Society, the Alliance for the Chesapeake Bay, they all have great lists as well. I mean, and many uh, native plant nurseries or seed providers like Ernst, uh, they clearly indicate which species are native uh, and which are not. So I think those are becoming really good resources as more people jump on to the native plant ideas. Um, I think there's a lot out there. The biggest thing is to make sure the source of your information, um, it, something from California is still useful, but what might be native out west may not be native on the east coast. So just be thinking about the northeast or the mid-Atlantic, Piedmont, if you live in the Harrisburg area, um, and think about that when you make your choices. Um, there also is a website called paflora.org. It's run by the Academy of Sciences in Philadelphia. And you can actually search, if you have the Latin name of a plant, you can actually search on that website and it'll come up with a map of Pennsylvania that has dots for where a collection of that species has happened in somewhere in the state over time. And that's a great resource too, if you're thinking, well, you know, I live in Northern PA, can I plant this? You can sort of get an idea of where it grows naturally, so to speak, in Pennsylvania. And on that website, if the plant you type in doesn't come up, that means that it's not found in Pennsylvania or not considered native. Wonderful. Thanks. Thanks for that, Kelly. Uh, and if you guys want to check out your chat, it looks like we have a few links that popped in there. We did represent DCNR with their landscaping with native plants. Kelsey Miller also provided us with some vendors. So thank you. Cool. Yeah. And I'm sure every, a lot of folks on this call probably have really good sources as well. There's a lot of good stuff out there. 
that's all we had for now. Kelly, okay, you cool. All right, I'll keep going. Thanks. Um, and definitely the biggest threat to native plants are non-native invasive species. Uh, this is probably something you've heard a lot about before. I spend a tremendous amount of my time during work and at home removing invasive plants from the landscape. Once they become established, they're very difficult to eradicate and control. This is a prime example here. This is Japanese hops on a roadside in Fulton County. Uh, nothing is growing there. It's Japanese hops and a few grasses, probably tall fescue, that have found its way through. Uh, but for, for a very long time, this is going to be a Japanese hops area. And invasive spread in a myriad of ways. But perhaps the most frustrating is the way in which we spread invasive plants. Uh, this you know, pile of Japanese barberry just waiting to be loaded onto a truck and taken somewhere to be sold to people chills me to the bone. Um, so many barberries. But you know, folks are making landscape choices based on what's available at their closest greenhouse or landscaping store, not necessarily thinking much about the ecological implications of their choices. And barberry is a classic example because it looks really great planted as a topiary or in somebody's manicured garden bed. But unfortunately, when I'm out in the state forest, this is what I find. You know, that same red cultivar of barberry in the middle of the Rothrock State Forest. Certainly at some point, it was planted in someone's yard, the birds ate the seeds and moved it. So even if we're not intentionally moving the invasives, they're still finding their way into the landscape from our landscape. Calorie pear is another example. You know, we love to see tree-lined streets blossoming for a few weeks in the springtime, but unfortunately, right next door to this development, I took, you know, I see these kinds of things all over the place, especially where I used to live in Chester County, where right across the street, you've got this new flush of, of calorie pear coming in on an otherwise pretty decent woodland for Southeast PA. Uh, and, you know, these are the kinds of things where there's lots of other species that blossom in the spring. And there's lots of other species that have red foliage in the fall. You know, we can change these choices. And these are some other uh, slides from Dr. Talamy. This is the number of insects supported by some of our native plant genera is astounding. You know, in the hundreds, 557 for oaks. But when we look at invasives, the numbers are barely above 10. You know, so just by what we're planting, we're creating these depauperate ecosystems around our homes. And I think where we as, as professionals come in is really kind of talking with our neighbors, talking with our friends, talking with whoever will listen about how to change our decision making. You know, I think that a lot of folks think about the aesthetic value of, of the plant that they're looking at in the store. What color are the, are the flowers? How many will there be? How big is it going to get? You know, thinking about the curb appeal of their house or focal points, how much does it cost? Can it be private? Can I create privacy with this plant? Not bad things to consider, but they can be considered in the context of ecological values. Is this plant native? Is, is maybe the first question we should be asking. You know, will it provide food sources? Will I see more insects? Can wildlife use it? Uh, does it have habitat value? You know, thinking about the curb appeal of a dogwood or a magnolia, in addition to how useful it will be to the insects that live in the place where I live. Um, you know, creating privacy with native species is completely doable. And I would think that choosing the right natives, you can create a tremendous amount of curve. But I say all this is really as a primer for where I really want to go with this talk, which is uh, a discussion about lawns and maybe what we all as citizens of this planet and of the Commonwealth and some of us environmental professionals can do to try to reduce the amount of lawn in Pennsylvania. Certainly this landowner takes great care to keep their lawn mowed, to keep their shrubs trimmed, to keep everything neat and tidy. And it looks nice, I guess. It looks clean. It looks well cared for. I can see the mower lines, you know, but as a biologist, it's not doing much for me. And I really would like to get to the point where as a society, we can say this, this person doesn't really care about what's going on outside their house, you know, or uh, convince this person that there's other ways to show that they care about their property. You know, the, the fact that Pennsylvania has 2 million acres of lawn is astounding to me. 
there, there's 2 million acres of state forest in Pennsylvania. So there's just as much lawn in a state forest. It's crazy thought. You know, and, and we all know that lawns can increase stormwater runoff. We use more water to keep them from looking brown in midsummer. Folks are using lawn fertilizers and pesticides. Uh, we're adding greenhouse gas emissions uh, to the air from mowers and tractors, and there's very little ecological value. But unfortunately, the scourge of lawns isn't just limited to the areas around our homes. Now, this is a shot from Route 30. You can see there's lawn in the median, lawn on the edges. Uh, many of our parks have a tremendous amount of lawn. You know, and here's a picture I took at a park. And it's a very nice park and it's got a wooded edge and they do a great job of maintaining this park and it shows. And certainly there is a place for lawns, for small children, for picnics, for soccer, for baseball, all good reasons to have a lawn. Uh, but there's so much of it that I can't imagine that we need 2 million acres for picnicking and soccer. And when you look at this park, it looks like a good place to hang out, but really when an uh, insect, a bird, other types of wildlife look at this maintained lawn, really what they see is this. It's a pass-through. It's, it's, it's somewhere that they need to cross to find more food. Yeah, they might pick around and forage. The bees might get some, some nectar from the clover. The deer might eat the grass because there's not really anything else. But really it's a desert. It's not what they want to eat. It's not where they want to habitate. And just like us in the desert, we'd just be looking to get from where we're standing to point B where there's food and shelter and water. You know, maybe a, a better analogy would be this. You know, there, there's structure here for food. There's a place for it to be. There's a way to serve it. It's even labeled as to what food is going to be in what tray, but there's no food there. We're gonna move past this part of the buffet to a part that has food, right? Uh, and lawns, I think, are very similar. You know, uh, uh, native plants can provide an alternative to lawns. And, and look at the diversity of this meadow. You know, if we continue our buffet analogy, it really would look more like this. Way more food, way more choices, and lots for us to forage. And there's a couple ways we can do it. And, one of the ways is converting lawns to woodlands using similar techniques to what we've used to reforest areas or to plant riparian buffers. You know, there's, there's ways to create woodlands that provide better habitat. And I don't wanna be labor planting trees because you all I think are probably familiar with how that goes, um, but it is an option and it's something worth considering. But what I really wanna talk about is converting lawns to meadows. And Kelsey takes way better pictures than I do. So I stole a few of hers here with her. And just to give you an idea of how to contextualize this, you know, contextualizing these meadows around office buildings, around hospitals, around schools, around parks. You know, there's still plenty of mowed lawn here for playing baseball, in addition to having some native meadow patches adjacent to the fields. You know, this, this sort of diverse kind of landscaping is something that we can do. Here's a DCNR office up in Waterville. Uh, all of what was going to become a mowed lawn was turned into a meadow, and I think that the public really likes it. I know that the foresters who work in this office really like it, and certainly the maintenance folks who don't have to be out weed-whacking and mowing all summer lawn like it. Road sides can be treated similarly. Certainly there's places where we need to mow a little bit off of the road uh, for safety reasons, visibility, um, but not to the extent that we mow many of our highways. And these native plants can be used as roadside beautification species uh, anywhere in the country. This is along the state forest road in the show. You know, a lot of our public parks, like the one I showed you earlier, could look more like this. There's still places to walk, places to picnic. I'm sure in a lot of parks, there's areas that can be set aside for soccer and other sports, in addition to areas that can become meadow instead of just something that has to be mowed every And there's a tremendous amount of ecological benefits. A lot of it stemming from going from very little, if any, native plants to a, a tremendous diverse meadow where you're creating 
places for habitat, you're creating food sources, you're creating topsoil over time, you're increasing water infiltration, it's holding more water during flooding events, improving soil health, and you don't need to fertilize it and mow it all the time. I think there's a lot of social benefits to meadows too. I think that the diverse textures, colors, uh, heights, leaf forms, I think it's tremendous. I think it does a lot for us even subconsciously to, to be around these types of diverse habitats where there's a tremendous amount of insect and bee activity. And it just seems so much more alive, electric than a mowed lawn. We're reducing our carbon footprints. Uh, we're exposing more people to the natural world, which I think is important, especially children. And there's no weekly mowing. Uh, you know, I, I just don't understand the fascination with spending hours of every week mowing your grass or trying to compete with your neighbors to have it mowed as often or as tidily. You know, my father, who I love very much, is very much in this mindset where grass needs to be mowed twice a week. And it's just, ah, I just would, would want more free time for everybody who feels shackled by lawn mowing. And there's plenty of opportunities to spend just as much time outdoors doing other things that are much more enriching than mowing grass down. Are there potential downsides to reducing lawns? Well, obviously I'm biased. You, you've already established that, I'm sure, by just listening to me for 15 minutes. But you know, let's, let's break down a few things. Meadows do establish slowly. So in our world of quick results, meadows don't really provide that. And it does take about two years until you get to full establishment. But we'll go through a timeline of photos in a bit. Uh, there is a lot of site prep involved. You know, you need to prepare the site appropriately, particularly if it was a lawn, you need to remove all that competing vegetation and that build up sod. So there, there is some uh, intensive site prep early on. Um, you know, if it was just, we were just seeding the lawn, we could just buy some lime or, or fertilizer and some scots and, and throw it down and cover it with hay and be done. But, you know, a, a meadow takes a little bit more. You know, one of the things that comes up is, you know, will there be more bees? Will people get stung? Are there gonna be more ticks? Um, you know, the answer is probably yes. You know, because that's, that's our whole point, right? Is to create habitat for insects. But the thing to remember is oftentimes we're getting, we're attracting bumblebees. Uh, we're attracting honeybees. They tend to be much less aggressive than wasps and hornets. When it comes to ticks, you know, there, there may be more ticks in that meadow than in the mowed grass. But there's opportunities for mowed edges, mowed trails, ways to minimize exposure to ticks. And, you know, I would hope that people in the out, they use the outdoors would already be checking for ticks. It wouldn't be anything new, um, but it is a concern, I suppose. But if we're trying to expose more people to nature, improve our ecosystems, then we want some ticks too, because the possums will eat the ticks and then they'll benefit. So there are, there are some slight benefits to having more ticks, but that's a, only hypothetical. You know, there could be, but maybe not, probably not any worse than some of the woodlands uh, in and around our residential areas. Uh, you know, I, I've heard that maybe it's not safe for children to have these meadows where they play. And I don't disagree per se, and that's why we need a, a balance of mowed lawn around playgrounds and soccer fields, and then the meadows around the edges. But I think it's more unsafe for children to not be exposed to the natural world, to not know about pollination, to not see native flowers. And again, I'm biased. And you know, the, the biggest thing I think is that the paradigm shift away from neat and tidy is the only way to go. And certainly there would be people that would look at this meadow and think it looks weedy. Um, but I think there's also the idea of landscaping with the intention to create habitat versus create something neat and tight. And there's ways to mow edges, uh, put up rocks and corners. You know, there's other ways to show that you're trying to keep it in its area, but letting it do its thing. You know, something more like this. There's, this isn't the greatest picture, um, but you can see there's places for the meadows, there's trails to walk, the trails are mowed. There's places to be where you can be comfortable if you don't wanna be in the meadow. Uh, this is the kind of idea where I think we can shift things to. So which species make 
a native meadow? Well, the first thing we have to do is really look towards uh, existing meadows and grasslands, like this one in the Pincho State Forest that has areas with low growing grasses and, and goldenrods and areas with tall or warm season grasses as well. Or a place like the prairie that they maintain at the Jennings Environmental Center in Northwest PA. You know, th this is a tremendous spot. If you've never been to that state park, check it out. But these are the kinds of places that are natural or wild, and we can use them to get clues as to what we should plant. So a lot of our native meadows are made up of warm season grasses. These native grasses tend to grow better in the summertime versus cool season grasses, which is most of our turf grasses that do better in the spring and fall. You'll notice that they're bunch forming rather than turf forming. So they're gonna provide better habitat in between the plants as well. This is switchgrass from the taller native warm season grasses. And you can see uh, these guys are kind of dwarfed by it. Indian grass is another great choice, a blue stem, and a smaller statured one is little blue stem. And here's three of them growing side by side, just to give you an idea of the height differences. So we have switch grass on the left, big blue stem in the middle, and then little blue stem on the edges. There's also native legumes we can use. This is partridge pea, native to Pennsylvania, has tremendous blooms throughout the summer. Uh, it grows pretty well in most places in the state. The deer do eat it, but there's other things they like to eat more. In the winter and fall, it gets these tremendous seed pods, pods which are fantastic wildlife food. And it fixes nitrogen just like clover. It does not require liming or mowing to maintain it. Here's what an entire field of it looks like. And anytime you have the privilege of seeing a field of partridge pea, you undoubtedly will hear the bumblebees. They're attracted to it. <laughs> very much and it's it's amazing just hearing the buzz as you walk towards these fields of cartridge feed. We also like to use a lot of native wildflowers in our meadow mixes, uh, one of which is this wild bergamot, which can come in very thick and very beautiful after the second growing season as, as Mark will attest there in that picture. Common milkweed is a plant that we all know benefits monarchs but a number of other native insects and does quite well in meadows. Tall white beer tongue is one of the early spring flowering species we like to use in meadows. There's also butterfly milkweed, which comes in in midsummer. The mountain mints, if you live in a rocky, dry, ridge top type place, mountain mints might be a wildflower for you. It's a habitat they tend to prefer. And then as we move into the fall, of course, asters and goldenrods become the stars of our meadows. And there's tall species too that are a little bit um, more ubiquitous in some kind of roadside areas already, like Joe Pie, uh, a great meadow species, very tall, a good screen, uh, and really great to attract butterflies. And I think an important point that I want to make before we talk about just briefly how to create meadows is that they can be scaled up or scaled down. And our hope is that we can replace hospital lawns, school grounds, businesses, parks with meadows, but also backyards, or at least portions of backyards. So here's a, a small patch that is being planted in a yard, just to give you an idea that we can go up and down the scales. So what are we talking about when we talk about intensive site prep? Well, there's a number of steps. First thing, you know, select your areas. Then if it, it's already weedy or is grass, you wanna keep it mowed. Then you'll probably have to use herbicide or a similar technique to remove the turf grass and the weeds. You know, we have to remove as much existing plant material because that's all gonna be competitors with our natives. And particularly if it's lawn grass, annual weeds, invasive plants, it can outcompete our native meadows initially because they're slow to establish. Usually you wanna disc the site or rip it, do something to improve the contact, which we'll talk about in a moment. Uh, if it is a public place, you definitely want to install some signage. And then we either plant these meadows in the spring or the late fall. We don't plant in midsummer. Excuse me, I'm going to grab a drink of water. Kelly, while you're grabbing a drink, <clears throat> I'll let you know of two questions that just came in, and you actually attacked one of them. It was 
uh, that you know that you were talking about the fairly larger landscaping scale. Uh, but will these prairies and meadows thrive at a smaller scale, say half an acre suburban single family lot? And you kind of ran right into that one. Um, and yeah, so, yeah. And then uh, Japanese stiltgrass was another one that was mentioned that had taken over someone's wild meadow. And uh, they were wondering if there are native grasses that could displace that. OK, yeah. Um, well, the, the thing to remember with the, the suburban landscapes around homes is you know, a half acre, a quarter acre, a tenth of an acre, that doesn't seem like much to us, but to insects, to butterflies, to bees, that's a tremendous amount of space that was uh, formerly just grass that they could use for habitat, they couldn't lay their eggs, they couldn't get nectar or pollen uh, or hunt for other insects. So I, I don't really think there is a too small. There's probably a too disjointed. If you're the only tenth of an acre patch of native plants, in many miles in a suburban or urban landscape, it could be tough for some insects to find it, but I don't know that there's a too small necessarily. When it comes to the Japanese stiltgrass, that's really tough. Um, usually I would say that you're better off to spend more time doing the site prep, maybe doing two herbicide treatments, just to try to remove as much of it as you can before you plant. If it's already there after you plant, initially there's not much you can do, but after you feel that a lot of the seed that you planted has established, and by that I mean you see a lot of the plants that were in the original seed mix um, in some quantities in the meadow, then you, what you could do is use a pre-emergent herbicide. So these are a class of herbicides that uh, do not allow seeds to germinate, so, but they don't uh, impact anything that's already growing, anything perennial. So what you could do is you could mow the meadow low over the winter, and you could put down this pre-emergent, which can be applied really from mid to late fall to early spring. And that would stop some of the annual grass, the stilt grass from germinating and growing in the meadow, allowing an opportunity for the plants that are already rooted to kind of reclaim some of that space. And if you can give an edge to the native meadow species, they often can outcompete the stilt grass or keep it sort of middling down in the bottom, but not really taking over. Um, so that would be my first suggestion for a strategy for the silk grass. Great, thank you. I think yeah. uh, uh, we just had one other comment come in okay. regarding asters, Joe Pie, Goldenrod, et cetera, at the SU campus farm. We started doing staggered mowing to extend the blooming season. So these wildflowers have an extended blooming period, adding interest and in providing a longer period of foraging for bees. So that's thanks awesome. For that comment, Sean. Yeah, that's a great strategy. And uh, you know, something that I'd like to try in some of my meadows once they're established, because that would be awesome to kind of overextend some of the bloom times and sort of stretch things together a little bit. Um, so thinking about establishing these meadows, and this I'll I'll try to speed up because I know I'm running out of time. Uh, the biggest thing is controlling and removing the existing vegetation. And here, this is a 10 acre site in York County that we're gonna be planting this spring. So we used an ATV mounted sprayer to apply herbicide. You can see there's a lot of years and years of cool season turf grass in these fields. And, you know, herbicide has a lot of pros and cons and we can talk about that in a different presentation maybe, Joe, but really all I'd wanna say here is herbicide is a tool, just like a hatchet or a hammer. You know, you need to have those if you're gonna have your house, maintain things in your home. But you know, used incorrectly, they can be very damaging to property or to people. And I think herbicide is the same way. It's an incredibly valuable tool in the toolbox, especially for invasive plants. And it's something that we need to consider when we're thinking about how to, how to do our meadows. If you're planting a tenth of an acre meadow uh, near your house, you may not want to use herbicide. It may be easier just to pull up the sod, uh, scrape it up. Uh, or till it a number of times through the year to, to, to kill that material. There's other ways to do it. Herbicide just tends to be the most efficient. It also tends to be the most effective, especially in places that have a lot of long grass or that have invasive plants. So once we removed all the vegetation, then we do want to till or disturb the soil somehow. You know, every seed, just like every person that has their own sort of uh, idiosyncrasies and things they like and dislike, Seeds are only going to germinate in certain conditions, right? So some of them prefer the low spots in these holes in the sod. Some of them prefer being up top where it's drier. 
And this micro habitats and climates you're creating by tilling up the soil is really helpful to try to get the right conditions for each plant. And also, you know, just breaking up the sod, getting rid of the dead material that you sprayed or removed is helpful because you want really good seed to soil contact with these little seeds. And again, this can be scaled up or down. You use a tractor with a, uh, with a disc for big sites. You could use pull behind cultivators on an ATV or a lawn tractor. You could rent a rototiller for small places around your home, which is what I did. Or if you're feeling saucy, you can get out the mattocks and the hoe and the garden weasel and you can tear it up yourself. There's not a, a depth that you need to get to. There's a lot of recommendations out there. You know, four, six, eight inches is really helpful. Not necessary, but you do need to break up the soil somehow, particularly if you've got a lot of dead plant material sitting on the top. So that's kind of what you want it to look like. You know, you've got some rocks there, you've got some drier spots, some wetter spots. That's perfect. There's another site that's been prepped for planting. There's a turf to meadow site in Harrisburg that's prepped for planting. It's on a hillside, so we didn't really want to disc it. We did rake a lot of the dead vegetation and sort of broke it up as best we could, but you know, each situation might require a little bit different site prep. Next, we're gonna choose a seed mix. And if you're doing this for the first time, a lot of good seed producers have pre-mixed formulations based on habitat or aesthetic values, species you want in them. You know, start there, see how it goes, but you can order individual species and, and make your own seed mixes. Um, if you're gonna do that, consider the habitat conditions, make sure you're choosing the right plants, make sure they're native um, to the East Coast at least, or the Mid-Atlantic and Pennsylvania regions if, if you can. Um, the plants will compete with each other. So you have to give that some thought. You know, I would love to have 30 species in my meadow, but that's a little too much competition. And also some species tend to be bullies. Uh, something like Canada goldenrod can now compete a lot of other species. So you may not want too much of it in your mix or maybe keep it out entirely. But one of the tenets of choosing wildflowers is to try to have something blooming during the entire growing season. So the bloom time is gonna be important. Then you wanna mix the seed. Uh, this part is kind of fun. You can mix it in a bag, mix it in a <laughs> trash can like we do in the state forest, um, but you wanna get it really mixed up well. And when it comes to spreading the seed, there's a number of ways you can do it. Uh, probably the easiest way is by hand. So what you wanna do is take your seed, mix it up, get equal parts cat litter or sand, mix that in. And now when you're throwing the seed, you have something you can throw. A lot of the native seed is very fluffy. So imagine taking a big handful of dryer lint and trying to throw it as hard as you can. No matter how hard you can throw, it's still gonna just drop right in front of you. So a fluffy native seed does the same thing. A cat litter breaks it up a little bit and makes it easier to toss in an even fashion. If you're gonna use a seeder, you really need to find something that has these kinds of tines uh, that break up the fluffy seed and keep it moving through the cedar. If you already have a cedar you use for lawn grass, it might not work. You might end up with a big clump of stuff right at the exit of the, the cedar, or it might come out in big clumps and still spread nicely. So keep that in mind if you're gonna use equipment. Uh, but again, it can be scaled up or down. Here's a native uh, seed spreader that you crank that has these gears in the inside of it. You'll notice that the seed's kind of trickling out. When you are seeding, you're not gonna see tremendous waves of seed like you do when you're seeding long grass. It's gonna be more like a trickle because we don't need to plant as much in our meadow. Because remember, we want that space in between. We're not creating a cave. You can also scale up. Here's the same spreader attached to an ATV using the electronics from the ATV to, to spread the seed. Or if you're feeling uh, like you really wanna get into it, you can buy a native seed drill. This piece of equipment actually cuts a furrow, drops a seed and covers it up as it passes. But again, there's agricultural seed drills and there are native seed drills and they're a little bit different. And then finally, after you spread the seed, you wanna cover it with straw over the seed itself. Do not use hay, hay has too much weed seed in it. You wanna get straw. And this is where you can have a lot of volunteers help. My daughter, uh, sometimes helps out with these crazy projects I have, but she did enjoy spreading the straw at our house. And um, 
one of the recommendations we use is maybe 10 to 20 square bales per acre. Uh, I like to go on the, the closer to the 10 side. When you get it spread, it doesn't seem like it's covering a whole lot. And that's kind of good. If you, if you put down too much, you can sort of stomp out some of the seed from germinating. So what about maintenance? Well, one of the things that some folks like to do is once it gets to about eight to 12 inches in that first growing season is to mow it high. So maybe mow it back down to six or eight inches if it's a foot or so tall. And what that does is it actually kind of gets the plants moving. It signals that they need to re-sprout and regrow and they become more vigorous, but also it's cutting out mostly a lot of the annual weed seed. No matter how hard we try, we're gonna have annual weeds come up our first year and that's okay. Because if we do this mowing, they're not gonna be able to flower and fruit and we won't have them coming in after the first year. You know, a native meadow is much like a newborn. You gotta coddle it, you gotta take care of it early on. But once it gets older, it kind of takes care of itself. Um, you know, it, it can muscle out a lot of native invasives, keep out the long grass. But that first year when it's establishing, it really needs help. And once it's going, really maintenance is maybe three to five years doing some disking to create some more space in between clumps or mowing it back. Uh, you may do some spot treatment of invasive plants depending on your landscape. And if you're in a public place, you wanna be thinking about maintaining signage and providing information to the public. Uh, year in and year out. So what do these meadows look like? Here's one of my meadow patches two months after I planted it. Mostly all that's growing there is the oats that I use as a cover crop. When you get to the four to six months, it's going to look more like this, hopefully. Where you've got a little bit of the cover crop still in there, but mostly it's partridge pea, some uh, black-eyed Susan. All your, a lot of your other wildflowers and grasses are about two inches tall at this point. There's a close up, all that dead material is the oats, but the partridge pea is alive and kicking. A year later is when you really start to get that wildflower component. Two years, everything becomes very vigorous uh, and fully established generally. And uh, usually in that two to three year, you start to see the grasses flowering and fruiting. And then, you know, from that point on, you're really just increasing the density of some of the better competitors that like your site more than some of the other species. There's a bergamot patch. Here's a, a mixed meadow. Finally, here's a, a five-year site on the Michaud State Forest. You can see we started to experiment a little bit with structure here uh, and monocultures. So we put all the tall oxeye sunflowers along the back, planted some shorter stature grasses with the butterfly milk, excuse me, butterfly milkweed. We have some taller grasses to my left, sort of out of the picture. Here's another five-year site. You see we have mowed paths through these, these areas that were planted with different seed mixes. Uh, and this is kind of what I would envision a lot of public parks having is these sort of wide walking paths so people can really get into the meadow and really enjoy it um, and not have to worry about the ticks and the bees so much or their kids not being safe. You know, they can get in there and look around because there's ways to move through the meadow. So how do you start? Well, start by considering site. No lawn is too small. We talked about this a little bit ago. Thanks for that question, that was perfect, whoever asked it. Um, you know, think about sun, these species like full sun or, or mostly sun. If you've got a lawn spot, you can't have a ton of trees over top of it. Uh, if you're gonna use a field edge, you need to look out for invasive plants. Um, you know, and any place that you're just mowing is a chore and it's not bringing you any usefulness as a lawn, that to me is a good candidate. Kelsey's going to talk next and you can discuss projects and funding with her. Um, and if you're thinking about site prep, you know, you really want to be thinking kind of a year ahead or almost a year ahead. If you wanted to plant this fall, you could start in midsummer with your site prep. You'd have a few months to use herbicide and till the site up. If you wanted to plant this spring right now, you'd be really pushing it to get herbicide in the ground, get it tilled, get everything ready to go. So usually you wanna start mid-summer, whether you're gonna plant that fall or the next spring. Then you have plenty of time to get it ready properly. Because a lot of times that early competition can be what messes up some people's meadows projects if they haven't prepped the site well. We're working on a lot of training uh, and guidance and our partners. Uh, 
Alliance for the Chesapeake Bay, Xerxes Society, WPC, and, and many others um, are helping us with presentations, paper guidance. Uh, we're even working on a do-it-yourself manual for small landowners. Uh, all this stuff is coming, and there's a lot of great resources already online. Uh, our planting and seeding guidelines provide a little bit more technical information. It's written for the foresters, but is also a great resource, and it's on that wild plants page uh, at DCR. The Xerxes Society also has really great meadow guides for different areas of the US, including the Mid-Atlantic. So I encourage you to check those out and keep an eye out for other materials coming from Kelsey. If you haven't read Bringing Nature Home by Dr. Talamy, this is uh, where a lot of my information comes from. And I think he does a really great job of providing a good message to folks, uh, even folks that aren't familiar with plants or the natural world. So if you, you like what you've heard, but you haven't read his book, definitely check it out. I think you'll really like it. Uh, and with that, I'd be happy to answer a few more questions, Joe. Thank you all very much. Awesome. Thanks for that. Uh, that was an awesome uh, presentation, as always. I always enjoy listening and, and watching your slides. We did have some chatter in the, uh, in the chat box here, and it looked like we had some answers come through as well. Uh, assistance with signage. We might save that for Kelsey unless you yeah. know anything about no, that. No, I think uh, programmatic stuff Kelsey will be able to touch on oh. here in a minute. Awesome. And then uh, Richard Lewis is with us this evening. He has an awesome wildflower field down here in Adams County. He just shared that he uses a tow behind cyclone spreader that he uses normally uses for fertilizer. They tows that behind his tractor and uses perlite as a carrier for his seed. Okay. Um, and as the seed, uh, as it is spread on the soil, you can see the white perlite very well. So you can tell where you've seeded uh, mm. and what still needs to be covered. Um, another question uh, was the suggested width for your mowed walking trail within a meadow. Richard said he mows a five foot trail. Do you in the state parks or in any other parks? Have you seen a standard width for those trails, Kelly? Uh, I haven't, but to be honest with you, you know, we don't mow too many of the trails of the meadows that I work on for wildlife habitat in the state forest. Uh, I would say, you know, whatever your mower width is, if you're using a riding lawn mower and you're mowing three or four feet wide, you may want to take one pass up and one pass back. I suspect in a lot of parks and, um, you know, business campuses, schools, they have bigger mowers that maybe do a five or six foot wide path. And I think that would be sufficient. You know, the thing to think about is the taller stature grasses, the can of goldenrod, joe pie, they're going to sort of arc over the path a little bit. And I mean, I think that kind of adds to the allure of the meadow, but I, again, I'm very biased. So if I was thinking about it more in terms of public safety, I'd probably want five or six feet just because I, I, I need to kind of plan for a foot of arching over on either side of the path edge. So if, if you want to encourage people that really don't like insects, really don't like touching plants, um, you know, five or six feet ought to give them enough space to go through the middle without really needing to come in contact with any plants if they don't want to. So that, that would be kind of how I would have it in my, in my head. But I think some of you all who work in public spaces probably could come up with better guidance than that even. Yeah, great ideas. I know one of the comments we brought up when we were talking about ordinances was the proximity of the wildflower meadow to a sidewalk, so to speak, and, and to take account for that hangover. Um, yeah. And, you know, my, my mosquito and... Uh, born disease technician, you know, and, and who's now taken on ticks. That's, she's got some stellar pictures of those ticks hanging on to the, the end of those tall grasses. Um, sure. So, yeah. So and, from and, that standpoint. And I think the ticks is something that, you know, that, that is probably a reality of a lot of these places. Um, but I think there's education that can go into that with tick checks and using preventative measures, you know, similarly to how we talk to, to folks about getting out in the woods. Uh, we could do the same with some of these meadow areas. So while it's an issue, I think there's ways to mitigate it. Um, but I would believe that there's good pictures out there of the ticks hanging over the edges on those grasses. They're yeah, tenacious, and, and I hate them too. But you know, they're they're a part of our ecosystems for better or worse. Uh, so when we build the meadows, we have to expect that they're going to fall. Right. Oh, and I think you know you said it. Education. Uh, we're here. You're preaching to the choir for a lot of us. But that signage is a great one. Uh, you know, for the years that for the time of the year that we don't have the blooms to explain, you know, hey, we're not just not taking care of this field. Here's why it looks that way, so to speak, and yeah. our no mow zones and, and things like that. So um, 
All right, Kelly. Well, I think at this point, if you don't mind sticking around with us, if you have somewhere to go, I understand. But if you don't mind sticking around, if anyone has any questions that you think of, um, I'd like for Kelsey to come on and, and jump in and just share. Kelsey Miller is our uh, long conversion program coordinator for the Pennsylvania Department of Conservation and Natural Resources. She coordinates the Pennsylvania's lawn conversion program, which seeks to convert acres of lawn to forests and meadows across the Commonwealth. Um, and I, again, Kelly, not to scoot you off, but I just want to make sure we make some time for Kelsey here. Uh, thank you for your presentation. And Kelsey, looks like you have the screen now. Are you ready to roll? Yeah. Can you hear me okay? Yes, I can. Thanks so much. Okay. Uh, let me get my camera rolling. Okay, there we go. All right. How are you guys doing? Thanks so much for uh, having me tonight. And thanks so much to Kelly for making such an amazing presentation. It's a little crazy to uh, hop on here afterwards. I'm like, oh man, okay, you just stole the show here. Awesome job. Um, and, and then just thank you, Kelly, for, for making that really strong case for native plants and for lawn conversion. Um, so I guess, you know, I'm just here to talk to you all about Pennsylvania's lawn conversion program. I'm hoping that Kelly inspired you all to start making meadows and forests in people's backyards. Um, and I'm just here to help you kind of act on that inspiration by giving you a little bit more information about uh, Pennsylvania's new lawn conversion program. Uh, as Joe pointed out, this program aims to convert lawns into woods and meadows to improve the upland landscape for water quality, biodiversity, and for people. Um, Apologies if you've seen this presentation a couple of times, um, but I want to start just by bringing you to this Cumberland County property that's circled over here in the red. Um, these are four acres of lawn that were heavily fertilized. They were mowed weekly um, by its previous landowners. And for that couple and those landowners, that was just how they expressed their love for the land. Uh, and really, this isn't that different from how a lot of people care for their lawns. This is how uh, we care for our lawns, kind of. It's probably how you also care for your lawn. Um, but now we have new landowners that are living there and they have a redefined vision for their lands. Uh, so whenever those older landowners were living there, these four acres were just four of the one million acres of lawn in Pennsylvania's portion of the Chesapeake Bay watershed that were contributing to uh, the increase in stormwater pollution, greenhouse gas emissions, and the continued loss and degradation of habitat. But these new landowners uh, have, again, they've redefined their vision and they've used DCNR's lawn conversion program and they're gonna have a whole new four acres of backyard habitat that is going to improve the water quality and feed both them and wildlife. So uh, I'm gonna guess a lot of us are pretty aware of the phase three watershed implementation plan or the WIP. Um, you're also probably aware that stormwater is the only sector source of pollution that's actually increasing in Pennsylvania's portion of the Bay watershed. A lot of the other sectors have made a lot of really good progress. Um, and this is, you know, this is important for a, a number of reasons. And one of the things that I think is really important to point out is that even though uh, a lot of folks are living in MS4 communities and those MS4 communities are putting together plans to reduce their pollution entering the Bay, not everybody lives in those regulated communities and a lot of people are such not subject to MS4 regulations. There are a whole lot of folks that are living out in suburbia that are surrounded by these massive expanses of turf. And that's where a lot of folks are using a whole lot of lawn fertilizers um, to, to maintain kind of this aesthetic. And the use of lawn fertilizers compounded by the short compacted turf grasses means that these lawns are actually uh, contributors to pollution that enters our waterways. Uh, and so whenever Pennsylvania's forestry work group was considering best management practices to address pollutants entering the Bay watershed, it set these really massive goals to establish riparian forest buffers, uh, which you know I'm, I'm sure again, a lot of you are very familiar with. That's what a lot of my work used to be focused on. Um, but I think we all are probably uh, in the know that that's not really enough to do. Uh, so that group ended up setting new goals to convert 10,000 acres of lawn to urban forest planting and the new conservation landscaping best management practices. So 5,000 acres of each. So these are pretty big goals, but uh, they represent only 1% of the lawn in Pennsylvania's portion of the Chesapeake Bay watershed. 
Um, and I think it's just a, like a really cool opportunity because homeowners like me previously didn't have a substantial opportunity to participate in a federal or a state program um, at any significant scale. And now with just the complete alphabet soup of programs, uh, practically anybody has this ability to do their part to improve water quality. So from the phase three WIP and uh, small watershed grant secured by the Alliance for the Chesapeake Bay, Pennsylvania's lawn conversion program was born last year. So I just wanna talk about that. So as I've already said, we have those massive goals to convert 10,000 acres of lawns to woods and meadows by 2025. These goals are set by the phase three WIP and are specific to landowners in the Chesapeake Bay watershed. That being said, this program does span the entirety of Pennsylvania, so anyone in any corner of the state can actually participate. Beyond those goals, the vision that I'm really hoping our program can realize is to make it possible for all Pennsylvanians to reduce the, their lawn footprint and plant forests and meadows instead. And we're going to need a whole lot of things to do that. We need a whole lot of enthusiasm. Um, and we especially are going to need to challenge our current landscape paradigm, um, that landscape paradigm that says that our, our homes and our, uh, our uh, <laughs> landscapes around our homes need to be this complete sea of fertilized and heavily manicured green. Uh, and we need to understand that these human spaces and these wild spaces aren't necessarily separate. So our program is kind of built on the foundation from Doug Tallamy. So we're taking a lot of his lessons and his research and bringing this uh, whole new opportunity to bear for folks to actually act on the inspirations uh, that, they, that they receive from Doug Tallamy or from listening to Kelly. Uh, and so this lawn conversion program provides this means to actually implement woods and meadows at a larger scale and to make it accessible to anybody with a lawn. Uh, these are kind of the three kind of backbones to our program. Uh, this would be our advisory committee, the funding, and this technical help. So we are currently establishing a community of informed and passionate professionals across the state to share information, to address hurdles, and to just kind of build this solid program and work forward together. We're also providing some flexible non-competitive funding uh, to partners to implement the projects so that uh, really, again, you know, anybody can really do this. And then uh, our team and our partners are planting woods and meadows and we're kind of just supporting everybody else to do the same. So let's talk a little bit more about these two lawn conversion BMPs. So first I'm gonna just uh, touch on the urban forest plantings or uh, I just call them woods because woods tends to be a little less scary to landowners. Uh, but the, the intent of this planting is to convert lawn to forest. So that means that the resulting community of woody plants and herbaceous later are going to have complexity, they're going to have vertical structure, they're going to have the natural regeneration that you would see in a forest. We're not just planting trees and maintaining a lawn underneath. This should eventually look like a forest. So kind of in those beginning stages, you might be mowing, but eventually you're going to cease mowing to, again, kind of get to that natural regeneration that's going to create all of that structure. Um, if you're used to planting riparian forest buffers, this isn't going to look that different. Uh, we're also planting trees at the same density, so about 150 to 200 trees per acre, and we're expecting about 70% of that sur survival of that original planting. So if we go back to that four acre planting in Cumberland County, this is what their backyard looked like last fall. Um, and so we're just kind of used to seeing this as practitioners, uh, but hopefully those trees are going to be maintained well, uh, they're going to grow, they're going to become much more similar to what we see in Bobby White Scarver's riparian forest buffer. Uh, we're going to see these taller, more mature trees that are eventually going to actually create a new forest. So Let's talk about conservation landscaping, uh, aka meadows. So this BMP was actually created for small scale implementation, but we in Pennsylvania are planning on implementing it in a big way where we're measuring primarily in acres, not square feet. That doesn't mean that somebody with a small lot can't do this because they absolutely can. There's so many different ways to do this. Um, but with our program currently, we are kind of focusing on the bigger picture. Uh, but the, the intent of this planting is to convert lawn to native managed meadow. So that resulting community is going to be dynamic. It's going to be ever changing. Uh, it's going to provide critical habitat for wildlife. 
and be a great choice for folks who can't plant trees or aren't just aren't ready for trees yet. Uh, they're not intended to be mowed every year so that they become wildlife refuges and they do need some maintenance to ensure that they're not overrun with woody or invasive plants. And meadows are just, I just love the meadows. I just think that they're this beautiful, desperately needed habitat type that can integrate really well into the home landscape and busy person's lifestyle while also providing a home for water and for wildlife. Okay, so let's let's take a look upland and uh, just as I'm sure a lot of you have been helping uh, landowners and producers achieve this kind of new paradigm for their streams and their farms, you can do the same for lawn owners too. So if you're interested in getting involved with the program, um, you can kind of get connected with me and we can talk more about what you're interested in specifically. Uh, you can obviously help implement projects, but I also understand not everybody has the capacity to do that. Um, but if you want to, we can also you know, talk a little bit more about funding, which I'm gonna touch on in the next slide. Um, I, th I think what's really cool about lawn conversion is that I, I think that most people can do it with just a little bit of know-how and some elbow grease. You can help with any landowner outreach or landowner responses. I have over 200 people in our inbox who are interested in doing this. Um, so there's definitely a whole lot of interest from landowners. Um, you can get tied into the CAP efforts, which I think I saw Aaron is gonna be speaking later. Um, and yeah, and you can just kind of help them implement their goals. You can also start to think about um, maybe implementing demonstration sites so that people can come and experience these new practices. And then obviously just get involved with volunteer groups like the Master Watershed Stewards to see if they wanna participate in education and promotion of the program, or if maybe they wanna get involved with one of your plantings. Uh, so actually this picture here is Susan, and I think I saw Susan is uh, on this call. Um, but she was helping out with a Central Pennsylvania Conservancy little meadow planting. Um, and this, again, is just something that's really fun and easy for volunteers to participate in. So if you want to implement, that's super, super great. So let's try to make a project happen. Um, so right now, I only have a single funding source available for these projects. And I am uh, both excited and sad to say that we've committed all of our 2021 funding. Uh, whenever Joe first reached out about it, I did have funding. And um, as of the end of last week, it's gone. <laughs> so I should know later this year if we'll have more funds available. Um, that should probably in, be in the fall. Um, but in the meantime, obviously, feel free to start outreaching for projects, uh, working with low donors and everything, because like uh, Kelly said, these projects, they do take time and patience. So it's always better to just get started regardless. Um, but I do wanna still talk about some of our current funding structure and the process so you all understand what to expect whenever we get to that point. Um, the funding that we have is a flexible opportunity uh, in partnership with the Western Pennsylvania Conservancy that offers a flat per acre rate for implementation funding uh, on land conversion projects that are at least a quarter acre in size. This is non-competitive, it's available first come first served. So one thing that's just really important to note is that landowners cannot receive the funding directly. Uh, they would need to work with an organization or a contractor that would actually be able to receive the funding and then that uh, organization or contractor will help them implement the projects. So if we tie back to that four acre project again, uh, the person in this image is actually working for a contractor uh, and the landowner had reached out to us about his vision. I provided that list of contractors and they picked this one. Um, and then the contractor met with the landowner, developed a plan that the landowner approved of, and then the contractor is working to actually complete that project. And it's been going really beautifully. Um, and that contractor did receive the full amount of funding up front and just kind of got to work right away. Um, but the funding, it just is this short application. It involves a cover page that just has some general project information like its location, the type of planting and how much funding is being requested. There is a five-year landowner agreement um, that's held between the implementation partner and the landowner. This just outlines who's responsible for what and then the landowner is agreeing to leave that planting in place for five years. We do ask for an establishment plan. Um, so just, you know, from prep to planting, all of that. 
we have a funding agreement and then we just ask for a map of the project. So it's pretty easy to actually receive this funding as long as you're willing to go through some of these things. Um, just one of the things to note is that the starting point does need to be a maintained lawn. Uh, right now, I, I can't really help if it's ag land or if it's kind of a failed attempt at creating a meadow, um, but there are potentially other opportunities uh, if that's kind of your case. Uh, ta Kelly touched on, I think, actually all of the resources that I was going to mention. <laughs> um, but if you're interested in learning more about meadows or tree plantings, you, there are a lot of training opportunities available through DCNR, through the Chesapeake Bay Landscape Professionals, or through our Morris Arboretum. Um, I know there was that question about signage. So Prairie Moon Nursery and Xerxes Society have existing signage that you can order. Um, and it's all just this really simple signage that I, I think it looks really nice um, and it seems to do a good job at just kind of communicating what's happening. Uh, we do have a small team that's working to develop some, some of that simple signage um, that would say like meadow in progress or just give a little bit of information about what's going on. Um, unfortunately, I don't really have a budget to print anything, but once we have that stuff developed, that's something that we can share out. Um, but you know, it, this is also something that you can do on your own. It doesn't have to be anything fancy if you want to sign. Uh, you can make something up in PowerPoint and just print it on a yard sign and just stick it against your project and it, it works the same. Um, and then I think I saw that Caitlin said that PACD has some mini grant funding for signage. Um, and then the last point on the signage is that if you do receive our flexible funding, you can actually work some of that into the budget for the project if there's room for it. Um, so, so that's all I have about our project or about our program. Uh, you're always welcome to reach out to me if you have any questions or uh, want to get involved or have funding questions, anything like that. Um, I just really hope that you can kind of connect with this idea that what happens outside of that riparian, riparian area matters and that as professionals in watershed restoration, uh, you actually utilize this as another tool in your toolbox. So thank you guys. Sorry guys, I lost my mouse. <laughs> Joe got kicked off the internet again. <laughs> so he's coming back on. <laughs> uh, thank you so much, uh, Kelsey. That was amazing also. Um, I'm not gonna lie, I'm excited to get some line conversion here um, in Cumberland County um, and, and in central Pennsylvania. So Joe, are you back on? I sure am. What an adventure tonight has been with CenturyLink. <laughs> Kelsey, I'm sorry I missed the end of that. and. Uh, I know we're running just a little late, but um, I, I do want to just give some time to our new Community Clean Water Action Plan coordinators. We have Ricky Whitmore from Adams County, Erin Latavik from Cumberland County, and Caitlin Lucas from Franklin County joining us. And they're going to And I think Joe cut out again. <laughs> so um, with that, let's turn it over to uh, our CAP coordinators. Good evening, everybody. Can you see my slides okay? Yes. Great. Thanks, Thanks Aaron. <laughs> yep, sure thing. Um, thanks for uh, having us finish out your evening tonight. Um, got a lot of education. Uh, a funding program that, that's new and exciting that you just heard about. And basically everything you're learning about tonight can be put into action right away. Um, so I'm here to speak tonight on behalf of Cumberland County. I'll let Caitlin and Ricky introduce themselves here briefly. Hello, can you all hear me? Yes. Hi, I'm Caitlin Lucas. I'm the Clean Water Coordinator for Franklin County. And I started about, about a year ago, February 2020, and have been working to implement our CAP ever since. So excited to talk to you guys tonight. I'll pass it to Ricky. Good evening, everyone. Ricky Whitmore, CAP Coordinator from Adams County. Uh, I started late, actually. I was hired in August, um, but I'm excited. I think there's a lot of opportunities in Adams County. And I wanted to thank everybody for showing up, listening, and giving us the opportunity to speak. 
All right, great. So we have countywide action plans and that's why the title on the slide also says help us scale up. Um, there has been a lot of really excellent water quality work done in Pennsylvania um, to local benefit to also the Chesapeake Bay's benefit. Um, our three counties now have countywide action plans, which we'll describe a bit here in a second. And um, we need volunteers to help us scale our efforts up. So we're here to recruit tonight. Uh, so as we um, set the stage here, as the note on the right hand side says, recall your location within this giant watershed. Um, again, all the work that you do clearly matters um, with respect to your local water quality, Susquehanna River and the Chesapeake Bay. Um, for those of you that aren't very familiar with the phase three WIP, there are uh, water quality goals that, that, it, that, um, that have been set forth across that entire landscape. And as Countywood Action Plan Corners or CAP here in the middle, basically everything that happens at the landscape level contributes towards our Countywood Action Plan goals, which tend to be focused on nitrogen. And everything that happens at the county level at the, at the edge of the blue circle here contributes to Pennsylvania's phase three of goals. So Ricky, Caitlin and I, what are we? We connect the dots. Um, our coordinator role is to uh, do public outreach, leverage funding opportunities, track project leads, connect landowners with technical assistance, connect partners with each other, which a lot of you on this call actually do already, um, and most importantly, for the sake of um, the funding associated with our goals, local activity reporting coordination, meaning when MS4s and, and things happen in developed areas and on agriculture, et cetera, when those thing, things happen at the county level, if they don't get reported um, into some sort of system, then they don't contribute to county wide action plan goals and they don't contribute to Pennsylvania's phase three WIP. So as I hear about volunteer tree plantings happening this spring, I'm thinking, what's my reporting mechanism for it and who do I need to talk to to make sure that, that it's something that, that not only counts in terms of volunteer time and, and camaraderie, but also towards these water quality goals. So specific to Cumberland County, um, we have work going on in the western end of the county that we feel pretty confident about and have a game plan, but on the eastern side of the county, and these three watersheds, Latorte Spring Run, Hogestown Run, Trindle Spring Run, we really want to create a watershed action team. Um, we're also interested in developing one in some portion of the yellow breaches because there's clearly um, lots of opportunity there as well. Um, in terms of the, the team goal, we, we want to have interdisciplinary skills. Um, agricultural background is great, but not required. We recognize that pollute reduction plan projects related to MS4 permits can be um, a catalyst for other things to happen in the landscape. So knowledge of those can be helpful. Um, preserve farm um, relationships can be helpful with respect to leveraging landowners. Um, so be thinking about where you sit in your, in your own local watershed and um, with, with respect to all three of our counties and let any one of us know if you have interest in participating in a local team. Um, in, our, in, in Cumberland County specifically, we have some neat GIS tools that we want you to be aware of that you'd be able to use um, if you would want to participate in one of these, again, localized teams. Um, as an example, we have an impaired stream here on Hogestown Run. We, we want help um, identifying project opportunity areas, ident identifying landowners, identifying the right person to reach out to the right landowner. And our role is to coordinate the county um, with partners with respect to funding. So on the right hand side here is an example of the GIS mapping tool that we have. Uh, the red stream is the impaired Hogestown run. The blue hatching, or I guess it's kind of green is uh, a restorable wetland layer, which could be an opportunity um, to put in a wet meadow planting if it's full sun, of course. And then further, our GIS tool identifies where riparian buffers are missing. So the, the green there is riparian buffer opportunity area. So to recap, we're recruiting. Um, first step to our action teams in Cumberland is basically looking for people that have fun analyzing maps, literally just poking around on the screen, sketching out areas, clicking on parcels, 
seeing who owns what and what type of relationships might, might um, line up. Second step is to um, specify those, those landowners and stakeholders might be able to um, assist with implementation um, and that outreach strategy as the third step. And then fourth and fifth are implementation. It's project scoping, budget, finance, and implementation. Our, for, for, for steps four and five, again, we have lots of technical assistance and, and some concepts with respect to financing. What we really need are willing landowners. And um, in the urban suburban landscape, there's still some opportunity there for um, this water quality work. So I think at this point, I pitch it over to Caitlin. Hi, all. Uh, I'm going to try to run through the Franklin County portion pretty quickly here. Um, I'm going to start with uh, our action team structure and then talk about some team accomplishments. So uh, at Franklin County Conservation District and for the Franklin County CAP action teams, uh, we use informal action teams rather than formal long-term teams. And for the DCNR folks on here, uh, we appreciated a model that, that we saw DCNR present in a long conversion steering committee meeting. Uh, that describe these action teams that kind of assemble for specific action tasks and then dissipate when the task is complete. So um, this structure has helped us to have only those interested in each specific project at the table and, and to help prevent burnout from volunteers long-term. Um, one of our big accomplishments from these action teams was our ag event and handout. On the next slide, We can see here um, the handout that we created with this action team. And this is just kind of an informational, like what is the WIP, what is the CAP, what are BMPs, why does all of it matter? And just kind of explaining um, what our goal is here and how it can be mutually beneficial for uh, both the landowner and for Franklin County. Um, so on the back, we also list, you know, some of the BMPs. This one, again, was an ag handout. So it specifically addresses some ag BMPs and some testimonials from some farmers that we've worked with, as well as some information and some calls to action. Um, and along with this, we held an event for ag industry people where uh, we kind of taught them about everything that's on this handout and asked them, you know, will you be our allies? Will you help us when you're talking to your clients and your colleagues, spread this message and, and how important it is and get more people involved. Um, so that's what we're looking to do here with watershed groups and the general public. And I'm looking to make more of these handouts if, if anyone's interested in joining that type of action team. Um, on the next slide, I'll just run through, we covered the first couple of topics. Um, a couple more team accomplishments, uh, Tammy and Melody were talking about some PACD mini grant applications that we were awarded for signage and educational events. We've received a lot of funding from the Conservation Excellence Grant from the State Conservation Commission and some CAP funding from our Chesapeake Bay office as well as some other ag funding that's accounted for uh, about $2.5 million worth of work. Um, so now we're really working on getting those projects implemented We've had some collaboration with uh, some of the MS4 communities in knocking out some of those pollution reduction uh, projects. And also uh, thanks to Aaron, uh, HRG helped us rate a section 319 grant that we hope to get awarded in order to develop a watershed implementation plan for Row Run. And new funding applications are always in the works. Um, as far as BMP implementation goes, if you could go to the next slide, Aaron. Many of our key players are very involved in the physical implementation of the practices in our plan, as well as the outreach efforts. Uh, the people we have sitting at the table are people working greatly on items two and three in our plan, which are um, soil health and outreach and coordination and education. So um, on the left here is just an example of a conservation tillage on the left-hand side of that gravel road there and cover crops on the right-hand side of the road in Southampton Township. And then on the right-hand side is another example of cover crops in Franklin County. So again, looking for those willing and able landowners. Um, 
In 2021, we are also looking, as Aaron said, to scale up our efforts, grow our efforts, and we want to have a large focus on funding and physical implementation of practices as we had in 2020. Uh, we also really want to scale up communication and outreach this year, which we know you watershed groups are amazing at. <laughs> um, we also hope to pursue additional partnerships and collaborations that we sought out in the previous year and, and actually act on those partnerships and be able to cr create some really cool projects using the available funding that we have. And we are definitely looking to increase our data reporting and verification, which again comes from that willing and able landowner um, participation. So with that, I'll pass it on to Ricky. Thanks, Caitlin. So outreach is a big thing in Adams County right now. Um, so the big thing we're doing, and I, I know some people on this call have probably heard this spiel before, um, we have a group of three advisory teams, an ag team, an urban team, and a legislation team. The ag team, because it's such a broad field, was broken down into six sub teams, uh, dairy precision feeding, waste storage facilities, riparian buffers, fruit growers, cover crop, and precision agriculture sub teams. And I recently met last week with my urban team, and that's the first meeting we've had with any of these groups and some exciting stuff came out of it. So move on. So some next steps for Adams County, um, some projects that we wanna get rolling in the county is uh, dairy precision feeding and advanced nit nitrogen management on farms, uh, as well as manure injection and buffers, both in ag and urban. Uh, lots of outreach, as I said earlier, uh, about the cap, teaching people about the cap, what it is, um, through various methods, presentations like this, the advisory team meetings, and I've been, I've had several municipalities reach out to me about coming to present at their supervisor meetings as well. Um, continue forming and making agendas and forming groups for these advisory team meetings. Uh, I hope to have met with all eight teams at least once by the end of this year um, and using information and discussions to begin implementing BMPs across the county. As I said earlier, I think there's a lot of exciting opportunities in Adams County and can't wait to keep things moving. So we put the um, a PDF of these slides in the chat very early on in this meeting um, because these links are awful <laughs> and I didn't, didn't find a more clever way to, to uh, to post them. So all of our county plans and lots of other background information are on the DEP website. Similarly, if you haven't seen the Healthy Waters, Healthy Community story map that they uh, published last year, it really is a nice website to teach the general public about different types of water topics and how this really does impact them personally. So wanted to call that to your attention if you haven't seen it or haven't looked at it in a while. And Caitlin, how about you wrap it up since this beautiful photo is yours? Well, thank you, Erin. Um, yes, I just wanna say thank you to everybody um, and also give credit. Uh, this photo came from a photo contest of ours to help build our beautiful photo bank. So uh, I believe this was actually taken from Pool Steeple. So um, thank you all for joining us tonight. Our contact information is listed there as Erin said, and we really hope to hear from some of you about getting involved with the countywide action plans. Hope you all have a wonderful night. Thanks for your time tonight. Thanks so much, Ricky, Heron, and Caitlin. Hopefully I can hang on to some internet for a few more minutes here. Uh, my chat box did go blank, so I'm not sure. Could anyone help me out? Did we have any questions that we missed along the way? Or I any I think we covered all the questions that were typed in. Um, does anybody have any additional questions that they'd like to unmute themselves and ask? Uh, I did see a question about cows in the stream. I just wanted to address, um, you can call your local conservation district about that, I believe. Um, we do have resources to help with fencing. I'm not positive about the enforcement on it though, as I'm not an ag specialist. This is a lot Rick of times, can you hear me? 
Yes, go ahead. I don't have a question, this is Richard, but I have a comment and that is that uh, I've lived in Adams County for 10 years now and as I posted in the chat box, I had, uh, even when I lived in Maryland 10 years before that, I did lawn conversion to wildflowers just because I thought it was the right thing to do. Uh, now it's become much more popular. I don't, I'm glad I watched these presentations because I, I'm probably not planting as many of the native species as I should, and I can change that as time goes on. Um, but uh, the interesting thing I want to comment on is that uh, Ricky Whitmore was one of the speakers. And when I first came to Adams County 11 years ago, he was a student. And uh, he, we were at Adams County, trying to limit a chapter, and we sent him to a a, uh, a uh, fly fishing and uh, cold water fisheries or whatever it's called camp. Ricky, do you remember that? Yes, I do. And I'm forever yeah. grateful for that opportunity you guys and gave me. He said it was a life changing experience. And then he went on to school to get a degree in natural resources. And now he's back in Adams County or in, in Pennsylvania, helping us all do a better job. So it's nice when you see something that somebody you've, invest, you've invested some time and interest in a young person that loves the out of doors and ends up working in a profession. And that's my comment. Thank you, Richard. Appreciate it. Thanks, Richard. And thanks for being with us tonight. It's nice to have the fish and boat uh, represented at our local meeting. Um, I'm going to go ahead and just post our evaluation form in the chat box. I'm hoping that works. I don't know, though, if it doesn't, we'll email it out tomorrow. <laughs> Uh, we'd love for you to take a minute to just, it's a really quick and easy form. If you don't want to answer the question, just skip it. Uh, you can click right down through. Some are open-ended, some are just stars. We'd love for you to give us some feedback so that we can continue to provide some pertinent and useful information for all of our local partners and associations. And uh, if no one else has anything, I'm going to go ahead and say we finished up a minute late and... Uh, didn't quite hold to the agenda, but we got all that great information out tonight. So thank you all for my presenters who joined us, uh, for our attendees, our partners and associations. We did go ahead and record the meeting and I believe we saved the chat, I tried to anyway. Uh, so we'll go ahead and send those out to our attendees and please feel free to share those resources with anyone uh, who you think that it might um, you know, help, help change their viewpoint. And, and always, you know, don't hesitate to stop into your conservation district or give us a call and contact us. So thank you all and have a wonderful evening. Thank you, everyone. <laughs> thank you, thank you again for putting this together. It takes a lot to coordinate these. So well done. It was a testament of partners again and again. So <laughs> thank you. I <laughs> thank you all, have a great night. Night.